All right. How's it going, everyone? Good. Okay. Good, good. I had a schedule change last week, so um, I, don't th I don't think it'll happen again, but I just had something I had to do last Monday. So we added the uh, class from last Monday just on to the end of this, so it'll just be in succession. So uh, we ended off in my book, anyway, at the bottom of page 79. And he's talking about uh, kind of the assembly line, production of food, songs and language, and even our souls. But then he's saying, you know, perhaps um, holding back time is not something he should be putting too much energy towards because progress is just gonna sweep over the country anyway, regardless of how John Steinbeck feels about it. <laughs> Yet I guarantee you, he will have more to say about it, regardless <laughs> of how little he thinks it will affect anything. <laughs> Uh, all right, so we're going to start. As I pass through or near the great hives of production, Youngstown, Cleveland, Akron, Toledo, Pontiac, Flint, and later South Bend and Gary, my eyes and mind were battered by the fantastic hugeness and energy of production, a complication that resembles chaos and cannot be. So might one look down on an anthill and see no method or direction or purpose in the darting hurrying inhabitants. What was so wonderful was that I could come again to a quiet country road, tree bordered with fenced fields and cows, could pull up Rosinante beside a lake of clear, clean water and high overhead the arrows of southing ducks and geese. There Charlie could with his delicate exploring nose read his own particular literature on bushes and tree trunks and leave his message there perhaps as important in endless time as these pen scratches I put down on perishable paper. Now, I love that because if you notice, every time that he's feeling overwhelmed, he pulls Rosinante off by like a babbling brook and he watch, watches Charlie urinate. And in this act, Steinbeck finds some solace um, <laughs> and actually says that maybe what Charlie is doing is as important as what he is doing in writing this book, which I find comforting. <laughs> there in the quiet with the wind flicking tree branches and distorting the water's mirror I cooked improbable dinners in my disposable aluminum pans made coffee so rich and sturdy it would float a nail and sitting on my old back doorsteps could finally come to think about what I had seen and try to arrange some pattern of thought to accommodate the teeming crowds of my seeing and hearing. I'll tell you what it was like. Go to the Uffizi in Florence, the Louvre in Paris, and you are so crushed with the numbers, once the might of greatness, that you go away distressed with a feeling like constipation. And then when you are alone and remembering, the canvases sort themselves out. Some are eliminated by your taste or your limitations, but others stand up clear and clean. Then you can go back to look at one thing untroubled by the shouts of the multitude. After confusion, I can go into the Prado in Madrid and pass unseeing the thousand pictures shouting for my attention. And I can visit with a friend, a not large Greco, San Pablo con un libro. St. Paul has just closed the book. His finger marks the last page read and on his face are the wonder and will to understand after the book is closed. Maybe understanding is possible only after. Years ago, when I used to work in the woods, it was said of lumbermen that they did their logging in the whorehouse and their sex in the woods. <laughs> so I have to find my way through the exploding production lines of the Middle West while sitting alone beside a lake in Northern Michigan. Again, okay, where is he? And that's a beautiful um, talk about being a writer. Because, you know, you, he's, he's experiencing constantly. And yet, how do you take that experience and put it into a book? Because this book is only about 200 pages long. And he was away for three and a half months. So he could have really written a book that was thousands of pages long. But what you don't put into a book is just as important as what you do put into it. And that's what I always try to teach my writing students. You, don't, you can't put everything you experience into a book because, frankly, a lot of it just isn't that important to other people. 
And it's not even that important to you because if you try to process every single thing that you do, you'll just be in your head all the time. So how do we distill, to use an alcohol term, how do we distill all this mash into the pure spirit of the book? And that's what he's talking about. So for him, he doesn't write hot. If we remember in the beginning of the book, he doesn't like to, to write while he's going through it, but he has to have some time between his experiences and his distillation process. As I sat secure in the silence, a Jeep scuffed to a stop on the road and good Charlie left his work and roared. A young man in boots, corduroys and a red and black checked Mackinac climbed out and strode near. He spoke in the harsh, unfriendly tone a man uses when he doesn't much like what he has to do. Don't you know this land is posted? This is private property. Normally his tone would have sparked a tinder in me. I would have flared an ugliness of anger and he would then have been able to evict me with pleasure and good conscience. We might even have edged into a quarrel with passion and violence. That would be only normal except that the beauty and the quiet made me slow to respond with resentment. And in my hesitation, I lost it. I said, I knew it must be private. I was about to look for someone to ask permission or maybe pay to rest here. The owner don't want campers. They leave papers around and build fires. I don't blame him. I know the mess they make. See that sign on that tree? No trespassing, hunting, fishing, camping. Well, I said, that sounds as if it means business. If it's your job to throw me off, you've got to throw me off. I'll go peacefully but I've just made a pot of coffee. Do you think your boss would mind if I finished it? Would he mind if I offered you a cup? Then you could kick me off quicker. <laughs> the young man grinned. What the hell, he said. You don't build no fires and you don't throw out no trash. I'm doing worse than that. I'm trying to bribe you with a cup of coffee. And it's worse than that too. I'm suggesting a dollop of old granddad in the coffee as well. He laughed then, what the hell, he said, let me get my Jeep off the road. Well, the whole pattern was broken. He squatted cross-legged in the pine needles on the ground and sipped his coffee. Charlie sniffed close and let himself be touched, and that's a rare thing for Charlie. He does not permit strangers to touch him, just happens to be somewhere else. But this young man's fingers found the place behind the ears Charlie delights to have rubbed, and he sighed contentedly and sat down. Any of you ever have a dog that likes to be rubbed behind the ears? We have a cat that likes to be rubbed behind the ears. Yeah, yeah. We had this huge standard poodle and it, whenever he was being kind of like ornery, which he could be, he was a true North Jersey poodle. Um, we, would, we would put our hand behind his ear, right? And he was a big dog and he would just start going down like this. And eventually you'd get him all the way down on his side and he would just go out like a light. We called it the Boston Scratch because his name was Boston, but <laughs> his whole body would just go like this. He was so like enamored of that place. Yeah, it was fantastic. He laughed at with the head sat down. What are you doing? Going hunting? I see your guns in the truck. <clears throat> just driving through. You know how you see a place and it's just right and you're just tired enough? I guess you can't help stopping. Yeah, he said, I know what you mean. You got a nice outfit. I like it, and Charlie likes it. Charlie, never heard of a dog named Charlie. Hello, Charlie. I wouldn't want to get you in trouble with your boss. Then think I ought to drag ass now? <clears throat> what the hell, he said, he ain't here. I'm in charge, you ain't doing no harm. I'm trespassing. Know something? Fella camped here, kind of a nut. So I came to kick him off and he said something funny. He says, trespassing ain't a crime and ain't a misdemeanor. He says, it's a tort. Now, what the hell does that mean? He was a kind of a nut, that guy. <laughs> Search me, I said, I'm not a nut. Let me warm up your coffee. I warmed it two ways. You make swell coffee, said my host. Before it gets too dark, I've got to find a place to park. You know any place up the road where they'll let me stay the night? <clears throat> if you pull over that way behind those pine trees, nobody could see you from the road. But I'd be committing a tort. <laughs> Yeah, I wish to Christ I knew what that meant. <laughs> he drove ahead of me in the Jeep and helped me find a level place in the pine grove. 
And after dark, he came into Rosinante and admired her facilities and we drank some whiskey together and had a nice visit and told each other a few lies. I showed him some fancy jigs and poppers I bought at Abercrombie and Fitch and gave him one. And I gave him some paperback thrillers I'd finished with all loaded with sex and sadism and also a copy of Field and Stream. <laughs> in, return, <laughs> in return, he invited me to stay as long as I wished and said that he'd come by tomorrow and we do a little fishing, and I accepted for one day at least. It's nice to have friends, and besides, I wanted a little time to think about the things I'd seen, the huge factories and plants and the scurry and production. The guardian of the lake was a lonely man, the more so because he had a wife. He showed me her picture in a plastic shield in his wallet, a prettyish blonde girl trying her best to live up to the pictures in the magazines, a girl of products, home permanence, shampoos, rinses, skin conditioners. She hated being out in what she called the sticks, longed for the great and gracious life in Toledo or South Bend, and her only company was found in the shiny pages of charm and glamour. Eventually, she would sulk her way to success. Her husband would get a job in some great clanging organism of progress and they would live happily ever after. All this came through in small oblique spurts in his conversation. She knew exactly what she wanted and he didn't, but his want would ache in him all his life. After he drove away in his Jeep, I lived his life for him and it put a mist of despair on me. He wanted his pretty little wife and he wanted something else and he couldn't have both. Charlie had a dream so violent that he awakened me. His legs jerked in the motions of running and he made little yipping cries. Perhaps he dreamed or ch he chased some gigantic rabbit and couldn't quite catch it. Or maybe in his dream, something chased him. On the second supposition, I put out my hand and awakened him, but the dream must have been strong. He muttered to himself and complained and drank half a bowl of water before he went back to sleep. The guardian came back soon after sunup. He brought a rod and I got out my own and rigged a spinning reel and had to find my glasses to tie on the bright painted popper. The monofilament line is transparent said to be invisible to fish and is completely invisible to me without my glasses. I said, you know, I don't have a fishing license. What the hell, he said, we probably won't catch anything anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right, we didn't. <clears throat> we walked and cast and walked and did everything we knew to interest a bass or a pike. And my friend kept saying, they're right down there if we can just get the message through. But we never did. If they were down there, they still are. A remarkable amount of my fishing is like that, but I like it just the same. My wants are simple. I have no desire to latch onto a monster symbol of fate and prove my manhood in Titanic Piscine War. But sometimes I do like a couple of cooperative fish of frying size. At noon, I refused an invitation to come to dinner and meet the wife. I was growing increasingly anxious to meet my own wife, so I hurried on. <clears throat> So this is an interesting part of the book because it's the only one of the only two times in the book that Steinbeck lets us into his family life and his meeting with his wife. The other time is later in the book somewhere in Texas where he has Thanksgiving dinner with her very Texan family. There was a time not too long ago when a man put out to sea and ceased to exist for two or three years or forever. And when the covered wagons set out to cross the continent, friends and relations remaining at home might never hear from the wanderers again. Life went on, problems were settled, decisions were taken. And even if I can remember when a telegram meant just one thing, a death in the family, in one short lifetime, the telephone has changed all that. If in this wandering narrative, I seem to have cut the cords of family joys and sorrows of Junior's current delinquency and Junior Junior's new tooth of business triumph and agony, it is not so. Three times a week from some bar, supermarket, or tire and tool cluttered service station, I put calls through to New York and reestablished my identity in time and space. For three or four minutes, I had a name and the duties and joys and frustrations a man carries with him like a comet's tail. It was like dodging back and forth from one dimension to another, a silent explosion of breaking through a sound barrier, a curious experience like a quick dip into a known but alien water. 
It's another beautiful description. It was established that my wife was to fly out to meet me in Chicago for a short break in my journey. In two hours, in theory at least, she would slice through a segment of the earth that had taken me weeks to clamber over. I became impatient, stuck to the huge toll road that strings the northern border of Indiana, bypassed Elkhart and South Bend and Gary. The nature of the road describes the nature of the travel. The unbroken speed are hypnotic, and when the piles peel off an imperceptible exhaustion sets in, day and night are one. The setting sun is neither an invitation nor a command to stop for the traffic rolls constantly. Late in the night, I pulled into a rest area, had a hamburger at the great lunch counter that never closes and walked Charlie on the close clipped grass. I slept an hour, but awakened long before daylight. I had brought city suits and shirts and shoes, but had forgotten to bring a suitcase to transport them from truck to hotel room. Indeed, I don't know where I could have stored a suitcase. In a garbage can under an arc light, I found a clean corrugated paper carton and packed my city clothes. I wrapped my clean white shirts in road maps and tied the carton with fishing line. <laughs> Knowing my tendency to panic in the roar and crush of traffic, I started into Chicago long before daylight. I wanted to end up at the Ambassador East where I had reservations and true to form, ended up lost. Finally, in a burst of invention, I hired an all night taxi to lead me and sure enough, I had passed very near my hotel. If the doormen and bellhops found my means of traveling unusual, they gave no sign. I handed out my suits on hangers, my shoes in the game pocket of a hunting coat and my shirts in their neat wrapping of New England road maps. Rostinante was whisked away to a garage for storage and Charlie, had to go to a kennel to be stored, bathed, and Hollanderized. Now, none of my kids know what Hollanderized means. I don't either. Anybody? Uh-uh. Oh, well, then I'm not going to tell you. Oh, God. <laughs> not we don't want to know. We don't want to <laughs> Even at his age, and I, and I mean that, he is a vain dog and loves to be beautified. But when he found, because I don't know what it means either, to be honest with you. <laughs> I don't tell them that. I just say, well, look it up, you know? <laughs> we will. <laughs> there you go. Sure. I think I have looked it up at some time, but I, I don't remember it. Uh, Hollanderized? Hollanderized. I don't know. Maybe poofed out, maybe? He's a poodle. Maybe, <laughs> maybe to be made more poofy or aesthetically appealing. You said it in a sentence three times. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, even at his age, he is a vain dog and loves to be beautified. But when he found he was to be left and in Chicago, his ordinary aplomb broke down and he cried out in rage and despair. I closed my ears and went away quickly to my hotel. He's leaving his friend. I think I am well and favorably known at the Ambassador East, but this need not apply when I arrive in wrink wrinkled hunting clothes, unshaven and lightly crusted with the dirt of travel and bleary eyed from driving most of the night. Certainly I had a reservation, but my room might not be vacated until noon. The hotel's position was explained to me carefully. I understood it and forgave the management. My own position was that I would like a bath and a bed, but since that was impossible, I would simply pile up in a chair in the lobby and go to sleep until my room was ready. I saw in the desk man's eyes his sense of uneasiness. <laughs> <laughs> even, you know, I can't even tell you how many times when I'm traveling, I'd go into a really nice hotel um, and just kind of like read and relax on one of their beautiful couches in the lobby, you know? I'm like, oh, I'm just waiting for my party, you know? Uh, hotels are great. Uh, he says, certainly I had a reservation. I saw that even, even I knew I would be no ornament to this elegant and expensive pleasure dome. He signaled an assistant manager, perhaps by telepathy. And all together, we worked out a solution. A gentleman had just checked out to catch an early airplane. His room was not cleaned and prepared, but I was welcome to use it until mine was ready. 
This is obviously pre-COVID times that we're talking about here. Thus, the problem was solved by intelligence and patience, and each got what he wanted. I had my chance at a hot bath and sleep, and the hotel was spared the mischance of having me in the lobby. The room had not, and this is just a fantastic scene, which goes back to, and I said there'd be another scene, it goes back to when he was waiting um, outside. There was a hotel that had little cabins along the river in Connecticut, and there was a little um, restaurant, and it had a vacancy sign open, and he went in, and the water was dripping, right. and there was pie, and he waited all night long, and he waited in the morning, and he drove away, and it still bothered him. Well, this goes to that same kind of private eye mentality that he has. The room had not been touched since its former occupant had left. I sank into a comfortable chair to pull off my boots and even got one of them off before I began to notice things and then more things and more. In a surprisingly short time, I forgot the bath and the sleep and found myself deeply involved with Lonesome Harry. An animal resting or passing by leaves crushed grass, footprints, and perhaps droppings. But a human occupying a room for one night prints his character, his biography, his recent history, and sometimes his future plans and hopes. I further believe that personality seeps into walls and is slowly released. This might well be an explanation of ghosts and such manifestations. Although my conclusions may be wrong, I seem to be sensitive to the spore of the human. Also, I am not shy about admitting that I am an incorrigible peeping Tom. I have never passed an unshaded window without looking in, have never closed my eyes to a conversation that was none of my business. I can justify or even dignify this by protesting that in my trade I must know about people, but I suspect that I am simply curious. As I sat in this unmade room, lonesome Harry began to take shape and dimension. I could feel that recently departed guest in the bits and pieces of himself he had left behind. Of course, Charlie, even with his imperfect nose, would have known more. But Charlie was in a kennel preparing to be clipped. Even so, Harry is as real to me as anyone I ever met and more real than many. He is not unique, in fact, is a member of a fairly large group. Therefore, he becomes of interest in any investigation of America. Before I begin to patch him together, lest a number of men grow nervous, <laughs> let me declare that his name is not Harry. He lives in Westport, Connecticut. This information comes from the laundry strips from several shirts. A man usually lives where he has his shirts laundered. But see, that's a big clue right there, especially with how much detail he goes into. I'm guessing somebody read this book and it ended in divorce, but that's just my catch. <laughs> I only suspect that he commutes to work in New York. His trip to Chicago was primarily a business trip with some traditional pleasures thrown in. I know his name because he signed it a number of times on hotel stationery, each signature with a slightly different slant. This seems to indicate that he is not entirely sure of himself in the business world, but there were other signs of that. He had started a letter to his wife, which also ended in the wastebasket. Darling, everything is going okay. Tried to call your aunt, but no answer. I wish you were here with me. This is a lonesome town. You forgot to put in my cufflinks. What are cufflinks? <laughs> <laughs> I bought a cheap pair at Marshall Field. I'm writing this while I wait for CE to call. Hope he brings the continue. It's just as well that Darling didn't drop in to make Chicago less lonesome for Harry. His guest was not C.E. with a contract. She was a brunette and wore very pale lipstick, cigarette butts in the ashtray in the edge of a highball glass. Now he goes into his P.I. mode. This is really fantastic. They drank, they drank Jack Daniels, a whole bottle. An empty bottle, six soda bottles, and a tub that had held ice cubes. She used a heavy perfume and did not stay the night. The second pillow used but not slept on. Also, no lipstick on discarded tissues. 
I like to think her name was Lucille. I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe because it was and is. She was a nervous friend, smoked Harry's recessed filtered cigarettes, but stubbed each one out only one third smoked and lighted another. And she didn't put them out. She crushed them, frayed the ends. There's a lot of detail. He's looking, he's looking through cigarettes here. Lucille wore one of those little smidgens of hats held on by interned combs. One of the combs broke loose. That and a bobby pin beside the bed told me Lucille is a brunette. I don't know whether or not Lucille is professional, but at least she has practiced. There is a fine business-like quality about her. She didn't leave too many things around as an amateur might. Also, she didn't get drunk. Her glass was empty, but the vase of red roses, courtesy of the management, smelled of Jack Daniels, and it didn't do them any good. Got <laughs> 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 the flowers drunk. <laughs> that, that is a great detail that you noticed right there. That's really fascinating. I wonder what Harry and Lucille talked about. I wonder whether she made him less lonesome. Somehow, I doubt it. I think both of them were doing what was expected of them. Harry shouldn't have slugged his drinks. His stomach isn't up to it. Tums wrappers in the wastebasket. <laughs> <laughs> I guess his business is a sensitive one and hard on the stomach. Lonesome Harry must have finished the bottle after Lucille left. He had a hangover. Two foil tubes of bromo seltzer in the bathroom. <laughs> Three things haunted me about Lonesome Harry. And if you remember, it haunted is the exact word used earlier on when he drove away from that hotel and restaurant that had a vacancy sign, but nobody ever came to. The word was, it still haunted him as he drove away. First, I don't think he had any fun. Second, I think he was really lonesome, maybe in a chronic state. And third, he didn't do a single thing that couldn't be predicted. Didn't break a glass or a mirror, committed no outrages, left no physical evidence of joy. I had been hobbling around with one boot off, finding out about Harry. I even looked under the bed and in the closet. He hadn't even forgotten the tie. I felt sad about Harry. <laughs> so, so as a reader, I always ask my students about this. As a reader, one, do you enjoy that segment? And two, as a reader, how does it make you feel about Steinbeck as a narrator? So that is my question. It makes me trust him. Makes you trust him? Molly? We, we all like a mystery. And he was going around trying to solve the mystery of this lonely man. And uh, it, it really captured my imagination. Mm. And could it point to the fact, too, that Steinbeck is a bit lonely? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. that he filled his time in and maybe was attuned to this other man's loneliness because he, too, is missing his wife and hasn't seen her for a long time? Yes. Yes. A lot of this trip is not just a travelogue. It's really a, a, a personal diary of his interactions with people. And you get the feeling he's really looking for these interactions every place he goes. Some of them happen to him, like when the guy finds him parked under the tree and others he actively seeks out himself. But he creates this narrative around these interactions that uh, uh, really are, are so, so vivid. It almost makes you want to see it uh, uh, dramatized, you know, <laughs> to see what it would be like if people made a drama out of it. It would be really cool. I've always thought that it would be a great either a movie might be tough because there's so much to it, but yeah, like a dramatic series. Yeah, I've always wanted to, uh, especially who would play Charlie? That would be my big, you know, casting <laughs> Charlie would be a major thing. You know, you got to find just the right dog. Should be a 10, 10, 10 episode Netflix series. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd watch it, right? That would be cool. Yeah, when he yeah. came to this scene, he, it was it was sort of fade out, and you'd sort of see it in the background, kind of a Harry and his partner, kind of, you know, uh, interacting there in that hotel room. Yeah, yeah, and you can really. I mean, he really brings this lonesome Harry uh, character to life, and it says, 
you know, to him, this guy is real, perhaps more real than, than other, other people he met along the way. So it, it's a very interesting scene, um, like that previous scene um, where he's waiting for the people to show up and never rise. It shows his, his um, he has a real, you know, private eye kind of part of himself um, that he's exercising. And I think he has fun with it. And I think it also um, shows a little bit of his loneliness too. And now it's interesting because he's going to do something that he has to do, but he takes very little time to do it. And as a writer, I understand why. Because when you're writing something, oh, go ahead, Molly. No, I just, before you start reading again, I thought I'd, I'd let you know what Hollanderized is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's <laughs> a man from Poland in 1889 came to Newark, New Jersey and opened a fur cleaning <laughs> business. And so, and apparently he built his business, you know, th those were the days when women wore furs. So he probably had a really good business, but um, that's what it all is, is Hollanderized <laughs> that's because he cleaned furs. So wow. now we, that's what Charlie was getting. Hollanderized. All right, that's great. Newark, New Jersey, huh? Yeah, yeah. From Poland to Newark, cleaning furs. Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Molly. Yeah. <laughs> Professor Jake, you were just going to say that as a writer, you were going to just mention a sentence right before Molly spoke. Oh, yeah, as a writer. So this next part that I'm going to read, this brief part, he has to kind of explain away something because he's not really going to write about his time with his wife, right? And some readers might want to know about that time with his wife. But I understand this because I, too, <clears throat> in writing things, you can't always add somebody into something and keep the same flow. And so he is going to tell us that really quickly, and he's not going to like spend a lot of time explaining to you why not. He says, Chicago was a break in my journey a resumption of my name, identity, and happy marital status. My wife flew in from the East for her brief visit. I was delighted at the change back to my known and trusted life. But here, I run into a literary difficulty. So not a personal difficulty, which I understand, but a literary difficulty, which I also understand. Chicago broke my continuity. This is permissible in life, but not in writing. So I leave Chicago out because it is off the line, out of drawing. In my travels, it was pleasant and good. In writing, it would contribute only a disunity. And I get it, I get it. Because if, you know, he's like talking, he's rolling, he's traveling, and if he stops and talks about him and his wife having dinner, about other, it's, it's a disunity. He could do it, he could but it's just what you leave out is just as important as you put in. I'm happy that he took these two short paragraphs to tell us that at the beginning of part three, but I'm also fine with him not writing about his time with his wife. You might not be though, and that's okay. When that time was over and the goodbyes said, I had to go through the same lost loneliness all over again, and it was no less painful than at first. There seemed to be no cure for loneliness, save only being alone. And I label this next part dog psychology. Charlie was torn three ways, with anger at me for leaving him, with gladness at the sight of Rosinante, and with pure pride in his appearance. For when Charlie is groomed and clipped and washed, he is as pleased with himself as is a man with a good tailor or a woman newly patented. Pat patinade by a beauty parlor, all of whom can believe they are like that clear through. Charlie, Charlie, Charlie's combed columns of legs were noble things. His cap of silver blue fur was rakish and he carried the pom-pom of his tail like the baton of a bandmaster. A wealth of combed and clipped mustache gave him the appearance and attitude of a French rake of the 19th century and incidentally concealed his crooked front teeth. I happen to know what he looks like without the tailoring. One summer when his fur grew matted and mildewed, I clipped him to the skin. Under those sturdy towers of legs or spindly shanks thin and not too straight, 
With his chest ruff removed, one can see the stagging stomach of the middle-aged. But if Charlie was aware of his deep down inadequacy, he gave no sign. If manners maketh man, then manner and grooming maketh poodle. He sat straight and nobly in the seat of Rosinante, and he gave me to understand that while forgiveness was not impossible, I was half going to have to work for it. <laughs> I love that line, like the dog sitting there like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to forgive you, but just work for it, buddy. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, he is a fraud, and I know it. Once when our boys were little and in summer camp, we paid them the deadly parents visit. When we were about to depart, a lady parent told us she had to leave quickly to keep her child from going into hysterics. And with brave but trembling lips, she fled blindly, masking her feeling to save her child. The boy watched her go and then with infinite relief went back to his gang and his business knowing that he too had played the game. And I know for a fact that five minutes after I had left, Charlie he had found new friends and had made his arrangements for his comfort. But one thing Charlie did not fake. He was delighted to be traveling again. And for a few days, he was an ornament to the trip. All right. So again, that's just a, like a page and a quarter about his time you know, with his wife, then getting Charlie and resuming the trip, but it provides a good, it needed to be put there rather than just going right back to the trip and then everybody would be like, well, well why didn't you write about it? Illinois did a fair autumn day for us, crisp and clean. We moved quickly northward, heading for Wisconsin through a noble land of good fields and magnificent trees, a gentleman's countryside, neat and white fenced, and I would guess subsidized by outside income. It did not seem to me to have the thrust of land that supports itself and its owner. Rather, it was like a beautiful woman who requires the support and help of many faceless ones just to keep going. But this fact does not make her less lovely if you can afford her. It is possible, even probable, to be told the truth about a place, to accept it, to know it, and at the same time, not to know anything about it. So here's my question. Has anybody ever heard about a place before you went there? Heard about a place, had it described to you, and you kind of accepted that, and you built up an image of it. But then eventually, you went there. And when you went there, it did not match the previous image you had concocted or been fed to in your head. Yeah? My mother is a travel agent and I've been very, very blessed to travel to many places ever since I was five years old. And um, we went on a camping safari to, to Kenya and it was not at all what I expected. <laughs> um, almost got kidnapped by a Maasai warrior. <laughs> so yeah, it was uh, more dangerous than I envisioned it being. And you didn't expect that? No, I thought it was just a glamorous, you know, camping. Just zebras and elephants hanging out. Yes, not knowing that lions were nearby and a, a, a Maasai tribe um, very close <laughs> where my dad and I, well, my dad and I were rebels and we kind of went off the beaten path when we weren't supposed to. And that's why the Maasai tribe found us. And one of the members, one of the members of the tribe. Um, but I share that story with you because it was as a, I was only 11, almost 12 years old and I had pictured it so serene and, and not as, uh, active in that sense of with people. I thought it was just going to be animals. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it can't, it doesn't always have to be people, animal, it could be anything, right? Like. You, you get this picture and it doesn't match your picture, then it can be kind of earth, earth shaking when you're in an experience that doesn't match it. Exactly. Anybody, anybody else? Uh, Some place that didn't match your original idea? My wife and I went to Disneyland uh, as adults 
shortly after we were married. And we had grown up with the Disneyland of TV. You know, it was this fantastic place. We had our daughter with us and all she was, you know, we, we, were, we sort of had this idea, this magical place. It wasn't so magical when we got there. We want her to have fun. All she wanted to do was to climb on the Tom Sawyer, uh, uh, you know, trees. And didn't want any rides, anything like that. It was a total different experience than one might expect. <laughs> wasn't magical. Was well, that's interesting too because, like, you had an idea too of how she would experience the place, and then she experienced it different, which gave you a different experience. Exactly. Yeah. Very multi-leveled. Very yeah. interesting. All right. It is possible, even probable, to be told the truth about a place, to accept it, to know it, and at the same time, not to know anything about it. I had never been to Wisconsin, but all my life I had heard about it, had eaten its cheeses, some of them as good as any in the world, and I must have seen pictures. Everyone must have. Why then was I unprepared for the beauty of this region, for its variety of field and hill, forest, lake? I think now I must have considered it one big level cow pasture because of the state's enormous yield of milk products. I never saw a country that changed so rapidly. And because I had not expected it, everything I saw brought a delight. I don't know how it is in other seasons. The summers may reek and rock with heat. The winters may groan with dismal cold. But when I saw it for the first and only time in early October, the air was rich with butter colored sunlight not fuzzy, but crisp and clear so that every frost gay tree was set off. The rising hills were not compounded, but alone and separate. There was a penetration of the light into solid substance so that I seemed to see into things deep in. And I've seen that kind of light elsewhere only in Greece. But here I call him out because he gave a very similar description of Maine. Um, by Little Deer Isle, that the light penetrated and things were singular and each tree was its own thing. So he, so maybe he didn't put that because it's in this book. And so previous to that, it was Greece. But he has said a similar thing in Maine. And that's why he really liked being in Maine because everything stood out to him. Um, he says, it was a magic day. The land dripped with richness, the fat cows and pigs gleaming against green, and in the smaller holdings, corn standing in little tents as corn should, and pumpkins all about. How many of you have been to Wisconsin? Okay. Every place looks better in October. That's, that's true. That's, I've been to Wisconsin twice, both times in October, and it was beautiful. <laughs> I think, and you're right, pretty much, it's pretty much the best time to be anywhere. <laughs> I don't know whether or not Wisconsin has a cheese tasting festival, but I, who am a lover of cheese, believe it should. Cheese was everywhere, cheese centers, cheese cooperatives, cheese stores and stands, perhaps even cheese ice cream. <laughs> I, I can believe anything since I saw a score of signs advertising Swiss cheese candy. It is sad that I didn't stop to sample Swiss cheese candy. Now I can't persuade anyone that it exists, that I did not make it up. Beside the road, I saw a very large establishment, the greatest distributor of seashells in the world. And this in Wisconsin, which hasn't known a sea since pre-Cambrian times. But Wisconsin is loaded with surprises. I had heard of the Wisconsin Dells, but was not prepared for the weird country sculptured by the Ice Age, a strange gleaming country of water and carved rock, black and green, and it is, it's very, strange place, the Wisconsin Dells. To awaken here might make one believe it a dream of some other planet, for it has a non-earthly quality, or else the engraved record of a time when the world was much younger and much different. Clinging to the sides of the dreamlike waterways was the litter of our times, the motels, the hot dog stands, the merchants of the cheap and mediocre and tawdry, so loved by summer tourists. But these incrustations were closed and boarded against the winter and even open, I doubt that they could dispel the enchantment of the Wisconsin Dells. I stopped that night on a hilltop that was a trucker's place, but of a special kind. Here the gigantic cattle trucks rested and scraped out the residue left by their recent cargoes. 
There were mountains of manure and over them mushroom clouds of flies. Charlie moved about smiling and sniffing ecstatically like an American woman in a French perfume <laughs> shop. I can't bring myself to criticize his taste. Some people like one thing and some another. The odors were rich and earthy, but not disgusting. As the evening deepened, I walked with Charlie among his mountains of delight to the brow of the hill and looked down on the little valley below. It was a disturbing sight. I thought too much driving has distorted my vision or addled my judgment, for the dark earth below seemed to move and pulse and breathe. It was not water, but it rippled like a black liquid. I walked quickly down the hill to iron out the dis dis to iron out the distortion. The valley floor was carpeted with turkeys. It seemed like millions of them, so densely packed that they covered the earth. It was a great relief. Of course, this was a reservoir for Thanksgiving. <laughs> that is a great, a reservoir for Thanksgiving. I mean, oh my goodness, it looks like black liquid. Like that is masterful description right there. To mill so close together is in the nature of turkeys in the evening. I remembered how on the ranch in my youth, the turkeys gathered and roosted in clots in the cypress trees out of reach of wildcats and coyotes, the only indication I know of that turkeys have any intelligence at all. To know them is not to admire them, for they are vain and hysterical. They gather in vulnerable groups and then panic at rumors. They are subject to all the sicknesses of other fowl, together with some they have invented. Turkeys seem to be manic depressive types, gobbling with blushing waddles, spread tails, and scraping wings in um, amorous bravado at one moment and huddled in craven cowardice the next. It is hard to see how they can be related to their wild, clever, and suspicious cousins. But here in their thousands, they carpeted the earth waiting to lie on their backs on the platters of America. Oh my goodness, that's such a good sentence. But here in their thousands, they carpeted the earth waiting to lie on their backs on the platters of America. So on Thanksgiving, I want you to go back, get this book. <laughs> After you've all sat down together at the table, I want you to read this paragraph to everybody and see if that changes your Thanksgiving dinner whatsoever. Is everybody, is everybody here eat turkey on Thanksgiving or is there something different that you, that you take in at Thanksgiving? Turkey. Turkey? Turkey. <laughs> I, I just want to say, I thought, I thought that phrase, I mean, I don't know if anybody else laughed out loud, but I did. Turkeys, turkeys panic at rumors. I mean, I think, to me, that's such a visual because anybody who's had chickens and turkeys knows that's a fact. I mean, they must, I, anyway, it caught my funny bone. And oh, I, he, does, I, he has I, this I, great I, knack for, um, you know, he obviously likes to describe Charlie a lot, right? Yeah. And, and I think he has a great knack for when he sees animals. He seems like, just like he's a PI with places, yeah. he seems to want to be an animal psychologist sometimes. Yes. I just love that. He anthropomorphizes them too, you know, that, that he uses the idea of a rumor, you know, sort of an a intellectual thing that uh, these turkeys are reacting to, but it's, it, you know, it's, yeah, no, that, that's true. Yeah. And it gives Charlie a lot of personal people, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, that's very true. And it's engaging, you know, it's engaging writing. Uh, and this is, this is also another, I mean, there's so many like uh, interesting little parts to this book. I know it is a shame that I had never seen the noble twin cities of St. Paul and Minneapolis, but how much greater a disgrace that I still haven't, although I went right through them. As I approached a great surf of traffic, there you go, he hates traffic, engulfed me, waves of station wagons, riptides of roaring trucks. I wonder why it is that when I plan a route too carefully, it goes to pieces, whereas if I blunder along in blissful ignorance aimed at a fancy direction, I get through with no trouble. In the early morning, I had studied maps, drawn a careful line along the way I wish to go. I still have that arrogant plan. Into St. Paul on Highway 10, then gently across the Mississippi. The S-curve in the Mississippi here would give me three crossings of the river, 
And after this pleasant jaunt, I meant to go through Golden Valley, drawn by its name. That seems simple enough, and perhaps it can be done, but not by me. First, the traffic struck me like a tidal wave and carried me along a bit of shiny flotsam bounded in front by a gasoline truck half a block long. Behind me was an enormous cement mixer on wheels, its big howitzer revolving as it proceeded. On my right was what I judged to be an atomic cannon. As usual, I panicked and got lost. And like a weakening swimmer, I edged to the right into a pleasant street only to be stopped by a policeman who informed me that trucks and such vermin were not permitted there. He thrust me back into the ravening stream. I drove for hours, never able to take my eyes from the surrounding mammoths. I must have crossed the river, but I couldn't see it. I never did see it. I never saw St. Paul or Minneapolis. All I saw was a river of trucks. All I heard was a roar of motors. The air saturated with diesel fumes burned in my lungs. Charlie got a coughing fit and I couldn't take time to pat him on the back. At a red light, I saw that I was on an evacuation route. It <laughs> took some time for that to penetrate. <clears throat> My head was spinning. I had lost all sense of direction, but the signs evacuation route continued. Of course, it is the planned escape route from the bomb that hasn't been dropped. Here in the middle of the Middle West, an escape route, a road designed by fear. In my mind, I could see it because I have seen people running away. The roads clogged to a standstill and the stampede over the cliff of our town. And suddenly I thought of that Valley of the Turkeys, and wondered how I could have the gall to think turkeys stupid. Indeed, they have an advantage over us. They're good to eat. <laughs> it took me nearly four hours to get through the Twin Cities. I've heard that some parts of them are beautiful and I never found Golden Valley. Charlie was no help. He wasn't involved with a race that could build a thing that it had to escape from. He didn't wanna to go to the moon just to get the hell away from it all. Confronted with our stupidities, Charlie accepts them for what they are, stupidities. And sometime in these bedlam hours, I must have crossed the river again because I had got back on US 10 and was moving north on the east side of the Mississippi. The country opened out and I stopped at a roadside restaurant, exhausted. It was a German restaurant complete with sausages, sauerkraut, and beer steins hanging in rows over the bar, shining but unused. I was the only customer at that time of day the waitress was no Brunhild, but a lean, dark-faced little thing, either a young and troubled girl or a very spry old woman. I couldn't tell which. <laughs> I ordered bratwurst and sauerkraut and distinctly saw the cook unwrap a sausage from a cellophane slipcover and drop it in boiling water. The beer came in a can. The bratwurst was terrible and the kraut an insulting, watery mess. I wonder if you can help me, I asked the young, ancient waitress. What's your trouble? Well, I guess I'm a little lost. Well, how do you mean lost, she said. The cook leaned through his window and rested bare elbows on the serving counter. I wanna go to Sauk Center and I don't seem to be getting there. Where'd you come from? Minneapolis. Then what are you doing this side of the river? Well, I seem to have got lost in Minneapolis too. She looked at the, at the cook. He got lost in Minneapolis. Nobody can get lost in Minneapolis, the cook said. I was born there and I know. The waitress said, I come from St. Cloud and I can't get lost in Minneapolis. Well, I guess I brought some new talent to it, but I wanna to go to Sauk Center. The cook said, if he can stay on a road, he can't get lost. You're on 52, cross over at St. Cloud and stay on 52. Is Sauk Center on 52? Ain't no place else. You must be a stranger around here getting lost in Minneapolis. I couldn't get lost blindfolded. <laughs> I said a little snappishly, could you get lost in Albany or San Francisco? I never been there, but I bet I wouldn't get lost. I've been to Duluth, the waitress said, and Christmas I'm going to Sioux Falls. I got an aunt there. Ain't you got relatives in Sauk Center to cook ass? Sure, but that's not so far away. Like he says, San Francisco. My brother's in the Navy, he's in San Diego. You got relations in Sauk Center? No, I just want to see it. St. Clair Lewis came from there. Oh yeah, they got a sign up. I guess quite a few folks come to see it. It does the town some good. He's the first man who told me about this part of the country. Who is? St. Clair Lewis. Oh yeah, you know him? No, I just read him. 
I'm sure she was going to say who, but I stopped her. You say I cross at St. Cloud on stay on 52? The cook said, I don't think what's his name is there anymore. I know, he's dead. You don't say. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Jake, I don't want our program to die at the moment. Well, that's exactly the spot I had for today. So we're, we're done. Oh, it worked out perfect. That's wow. Right. Yeah. <laughs> wow. It was really interesting and fun. <laughs> um, we definitely have one more minute to close up. So any, any final thoughts on our, on our reading today? A lot of conversations um, with other people, um, some private eye work. Interesting. You can't get lost in Minneapolis. <laughs> you know, there's nothing greater than when you're lost, somebody telling you, you can't get lost here. <laughs> well, if you know the alphabet, you should be in good shape. But uh... so you would have been one who like said to Steinbeck, come on, man, you can't get lost here. <laughs> you can't get lost if you know the alphabet. If you know the alphabet. Uh, all your right. fact, it's your fat person again. Uh, there is such a thing as Swiss cheese ice cream. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> and it's full of fat, it says. <laughs> now, I wonder, would you grill the ice cream, the Swiss cheese ice cream on some bread? I don't know. What would you do. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Make a <Yeah>. raclette. <laughs> that would be very yeah. interesting. Yeah, good. It'd probably be fat fried at the fair. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, we are, uh, let's see, what page? We are just about, we're gonna begin page 97. So we've almost made it. Um, we're about 40, I'd say 47% of the way through the book, so. Good. We'll miss you next week. Thanks so much. Take care. Yeah, great. Right. Thank well, you. I'll, I'll be here next week, but yeah. So those Good. of you who want to attend, and I think there'll be the option to be on Zoom or in the auditorium, so. Okay, good. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Professor Jake. Have a great week, everybody. Take care, thank everyone. You. Thanks a lot. It was fun. All the best. Thank you.